Amen. It's Mark number 453, number 453. We're blessed tonight to uh, have Brother Donnie Bates with us. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot in introduction. He, we, as, as he comes in and shares his reports of the work that's going on with Bear Valley on a regular basis, and so most of us are very familiar uh, with him and what he has been doing, but it's always exciting for us to see plans are always shifting and changing. There are, are always goals that have been reached and new goals that are being set. There are all kinds of accomplishments that are taking place. Uh, Bear Valley right now, um, attendance is, is on the rise. Um, the number of schools around the world are on the rise. Um, those in the master's program. I think there was a record number of master's graduates that Donnie is very involved in uh, that uh, took place this last, uh, this last year. Um, and, uh, and so just hearing the work of training men and women to do the Lord's work to the best that they possibly can is always an exciting thing. Bear Valley, of course, is very close to my heart, many of us who are here. And, uh, and so... Um, it is always always a blessing to have uh, Donnie with us to to help us to see the we financially send money to the school and to some of the works that are going on there and uh, and in many ways that's that's the easy part they're doing the hard work they're doing they're doing the 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 labor with their feet on the ground but I know that that support is greatly greatly appreciated and it is greatly needed and. And uh, they, there are always things that they are needing, even additional support to make sure that works continue. And so um, 
uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear, Donnie, the things that are going on, and I'll turn it over to you, brother. Thank you, Steve. Actually, you said everything I was going to say, so if you're here tonight, <laughs> um, no, I do appreciate that so much. It's a blessing for me to be here. I always enjoy coming uh, here to Cave Springs every year, and uh, it's a beautiful part of the country. And as Steve said, it's a beautiful work. Now, I can't speak for the students at Bear Valley, but I wouldn't want to go up against these guys that we listened to just a little while ago. Um, but I remember some of it. Philippians, peace of God. I got that one. I do so appreciate the support that this congregation gives us. And what, part of what you're going to see this evening uh, a small part of this report has to do with our international schools and uh, that work along with the work that I'm most directly involved in in Denver is made possible by hundreds literally hundreds of both congregations and individuals mostly in this country but not exclusively in this country who are doing what you're doing providing uh, some support um, for financial support for us to be able to do the work that we're doing. It's an exciting work, and I'm just so blessed to be a part of it, and I want to thank you personally for allowing me to be a part uh, of, this, of this great work. Now, what I would like to do before we get to the actual report of this work is have a bit of a Bible lesson, and the lesson that I've prepared for this evening really is designed to help you understand a little bit of what we do at Bear Valley in training our students how to dig into the text, how to let the Bible speak for itself. You know, one of the things that, that we in the church, not just we in the Bible Institute, but we in the church emphasize to our friends and neighbors who are not members of any religious organization or who are religious neighbors of ours is the, that we emphasize Scripture. The scripture has the answer to the problems that we find in the world. And we sometimes, in the minds of some people, overemphasize that. But I'm here to tell you and affirm for you or to you tonight that it's not an overemphasis. We cannot emphasize strongly enough the importance of scripture. Now, one of the examples that we find, and the one that I want to use tonight, is found in uh, the book of Colossians. I was afraid that I might time out on this. Let me see if I can pull her back up. Is it? There we go. And I may have to do it this way. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. We find this example. It's one of the prayers of the Apostle Paul that he gives us in Scripture. There are several of these where Paul describes his prayer life. And there's a couple in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 has a great one. Chapter 3 has a, has a great one. This one in Colossians 1 is, is a very important one for us to consider. Colossians 1 verses 9 through 12 says this, For this reason we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, First thing I want you to notice is how he begins this section in verse 9, where he says, for this reason also, and hopefully the highlights will come through on this. Um, I don't see it up there, but uh, I'll, I'll direct your attention to where I want you to look. For this reason, when you see this in Scripture, don't you want to ask for what reason? That, those are words that give us a clue that there's something going on here that's important or something that has just gone on that's important. For this reason, for what reason? If we were to back up in verse 8, we would find that Epaphras has told Paul about the, the love the Colossians have in the Spirit, presumably their love for him in the Spirit. 
And because of that, because he now knows and has heard the report of their love for him in the Spirit, he is offering this continual prayer. He says, I do not cease to pray for you. And here's what he prays. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, and so on and so forth. But let's stop right there. That you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's quite a prayer right there, isn't it? Now, you, you notice the word knowledge there. The word knowledge in this text is a very interesting word for a couple of reasons. For one thing, there is a, uh, there's a prefix here on this word in the original text that makes this word mean true knowledge. I want you to be filled. I'm praying that you be filled with true knowledge, with the true knowledge of God's will with all, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, there was a problem in Colossae and other places at this time uh, with Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a dogma, uh, a, uh, let's call it a religion, that really elevated even worshipped knowledge. In fact, Gnosticism comes from the Greek word that we translate knowledge. And so by elevating knowledge, but it was man's knowledge, man's understanding, man's wisdom. And Paul says, I'm praying that you will be filled with the true knowledge of God's will. Not my knowledge, not your knowledge, not the expert's knowledge. Not some religious elite's knowledge, but true knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And then why? Why does he pray that? Look at verse 10. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. I submit to you that that ought to be the prayer, the desire, the purpose of everyone who stands before anyone to preach God's Word, to teach God's Word. Class, sermon, doesn't make any difference. Whoever would teach us. When we were talking earlier with, with the, the young folks up here, James chapter 3 starts out, be not many of you teachers. Why? Well, the danger of the tongue is one reason why. There's a great responsibility, knowing that we will incur a stricter judgment. There's a great responsibility in this, I want my preaching, I want my teaching to be effective enough that when you, if we're going to apply it to this gathering here tonight, when you leave this place, you may walk worthy of the Lord. I, I want to equip you. Now, I have no doubt that you're already equipped. But every lesson you hear should further equip all of us to better walk worthy of the Lord. There are a lot of similarities between this book of Colossians and the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord urge you urge you, some versions say, with much entreaty, that you walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. You are Christians. So let's live, that's what walk means, let's live our lives as Christians should live their lives. And that's what my prayer is, and every faithful preacher and teacher of God's Word's prayer should be, that you walk worthy in, uh, uh, in, of the Lord fully pleasing Him, fully pleasing Him, in every way pleasing God. Well, that really brings us back around to the reason why it's so important to emphasize the Word. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul told Timothy, after saying in verse 15, you know, the same, uh, the, the same word, faithful word that you heard taught to you by your mama and your grandma, all Scripture, that Word, is inspired of God and profitable for teaching, 
for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that, here's why it's so profitable, the man of God or the woman of God, as the case may be, will be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. In other words, Scripture will give you everything you need to be everything God wants you to be. So I want you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, Paul says, fully pleasing Him. And then he tells us in this text, he gives us four, grammatically speaking, participial phrases, participles that tell us how to obey what he has just said he was praying for. How do we go about walking in a manner worthy of the Lord? Well, we start out first by being fruitful. And one of the classes that I teach at Bear Valley is English. English composition, and we do some English grammar in there. And one of the ways we identify participles is looking for ing words. Being fruitful in every good work. Jesus told us how important it is to bear fruit. The tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. We don't want to be that. If you hadn't figured that out yet, that's a bad thing. We don't want to be trees that don't bear fruit. We want to be fruitful in every good work. Well, what good works are there? Well, your life is full of opportunities to do good work. How you treat other people. How you treat people who are in need. How you treat people who are ugly to you. How you, if you share the gospel with someone. All of those things and, and, a, and a whole long list of other things are examples of good works and we want to be fruitful in every good work. You mean even the way I drive up and down the road? Well, you tell me, is there a right way and a wrong way to drive up and down the road? Is there a right way and a wrong way to interact, let's use that word, to interact with our fellow travelers? <laughs> yes, there is. Yes, there is. I have to tell you, there's, a, there's a, a major artery in Denver that's close to the Bear Valley building, Wadsworth Boulevard, that is, and, and for you guys, we have some, some of our young folks from Bear Valley here tonight will bear this out. Wadsworth Boulevard is a challenge to the faith at times. And I have to admit, there have been times when I have left the Bear Valley Church building, having taught a class or preached a sermon in the pulpit or something where I have, I have said something very similar to what I've already said here tonight, challenging, encouraging, entreating, with much entreaty, that even the way we drive up and down Wadsworth is an opportunity to bear good fruit. And then I have gone out on Wadsworth and totally forgotten everything that I just said because some knothead cut me off in traffic wasn't paying attention to what he should be doing, and then I think, oh, I wasn't bearing fruit in that good work. That's one of the ways that we do this. Increasing in the knowledge of God is the second one. And by the way, the word knowledge here, it's the same word that he used a little bit earlier, true knowledge. I want to preach and teach in such a way that, it's, that it effectively enables my hearers to be filled with the true knowledge of God. You know what that means? That means I've got to preach the true gospel, doesn't it? I can't preach to you my wisdom, my understanding, my whatever, and get you to that point. Which really kind of makes it doubly important for you to study it for yourself, doesn't it? That's the importance of God's Word. I want to teach and preach in such a way that those who hear me will be able to increase in the true knowledge of God. And then the third one we find in verse 11, strengthened with all might. And you might be saying, I don't see an ing word there. Well, literally it's being strengthened. So it's there. Being strengthened with all might. You know, to live a worthy life in this world takes strength, doesn't it? Takes power. Driving up and down Wadsworth Boulevard takes a great deal of patience, and, and patience of that type takes strength. 
It takes a will to resist the temptation to respond the way everybody else is responding. So we need strength. But where does the strength come from? Is it my strength? I, sorry, Lord, I've just got to. I've just got to work harder. I, I've just got to. I've just got to do a better job. Hopefully, one of these days, I'll be strong enough to be able to do this on my own. No, you won't. You won't ever be that strong. Look at what he says. This is the first one of these four points that he's making that has a bit of a qualifier. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. God's power. God's power. Book of Ephesians. The armor of God, right? The whole armor of God is described in Ephesians chapter 6. And he also mentions in that book with the strength of of his might. I don't have the strength. I don't have the strength to do this. But I don't have to. Now I don't mean to minimize my responsibility and your responsibility. We have a responsibility to put forth the best effort that we can. But the best effort that I can do is not going to be good enough to get me where I need to be. To live that successful life. Truly successful life. And go to heaven. I need God for that. And there are times when I look at life and think, <laughs> I'm sorry, Lord, I don't have an answer here. I don't know if I can do this. And somewhere, and that somewhere is in Scripture, God says, it's okay, I do. I've got this. I've got a plan. One of my favorite Old Testament prophets over the years has come to be Obadiah. And Obadiah begins his little three-chapter um, prophecy by complaining to God that God doesn't hear his prayers. And so God answers him and says, says, I've heard your prayers. I know what's going on, and I've got a plan. I've got a plan that is so magnificent you wouldn't believe it if I told you. And then he tells him what the plan is, and Obadiah says, I can't believe it. I cannot believe that you would have a plan like that. You're too good. You're too holy to use an unholy people to come and judge us. I can't believe it. And God's next response is, Habakkuk, I have a plan. You do your job, and you let me do my job. That's how Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, really, we could break it down to that very simple phrase. You do your job, and I'll do my job. He says in those verses, your job is to spread the word that judgment is coming. He, be, he literally says, your job is write the vision and make it plain. That means spread the word. Get the warning out. Judgment's coming. Write the vision and make it plain so that the one who hears may run. The righteous shall live by his faith. Judgment is coming, he says. And you got one chance to survive. Live by faith. Be a person of faith. And that's what we're getting at here. Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. He's got a plan. So that means you do your job and you let Him do His job. My job is not to overcome all of my enemies. My job is to hold tightly to the hand of the one who overcomes all of my enemies. Strengthened, being strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. And then he gets to that point about patience and long-suffering with joy. It does take patience to do this because here's the deal with God taking care of me. <coughs> it's the same issue as the good fight of faith that we fight. It takes place in the spiritual realm. I can't see it with my eyes. And so it happens without me being able to physically perceive that it's happening. And you know what that means? That means sometimes I wonder if it's happening. Which brings us back around again to the importance of emphasizing God's Word. The only way, the only way that I can know that it's happening is to stay in the Word. Because there He tells me it's happening. 
And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And by faith, I know that he's with me. And then the fourth, giving thanks to the Father. Don't we have a lot to be thankful for? Seriously. We have a lot to be thankful for. We live in a world without hope. Truly without hope. Yet we have hope. That by itself is enough to be thankful for. Paul told the Thessalonians, when you die, when your loved ones die, don't lose hope. Jesus will bring them with him. We'll see them again. He says in, at the end of that text, therefore comfort one another with these words. How is that comforting? Because we have hope. Hope is comforting. We will see them again. We have hope of eternal life. When the world, even many in the world who think they do, don't. We have a reason to be thankful. But here again we find qualifiers. Why be thankful? Our Father has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. I didn't do that. It wasn't my doing. Now, given all the facts, it might have been my choosing to do it, but I didn't have the ability to do it. God did this. And I'm ever so thankful that he did. Someone asked the question, I've heard many ask the question, what is good about the good news? A good friend of mine put it in a very succinct way many years ago that I've never forgotten. When you die, you don't have to stay dead. Another sister in Christ answered that question when I asked it in a Bible class one time. What's good about the good news? And that's pretty much what it sounded like for the first few seconds in the class. Nobody wanted to answer. And finally, one of the sisters said, it's got me in it. I don't know how to improve on that. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance in light. What a marvelous prayer that we find here. I'm, I'm hoping that I can get these the pictures for the report itself to come up. Okay, that seems to be wanting to work. Let's move down here. There we go. Now, I may have shown this picture. I wanted to include one picture in the report uh, itself of the faculty at, at uh, the Denver campus uh, currently. And then, let's see. Just to kind of let you, uh, fill you in on what we've been doing uh, in, since I was here last. In June of last year, almost a year ago, my family and I were able to travel to um, Newport, Wales. Now, as far as we know, this is the only congregation of the Lord's Church in the country of Wales. Uh, we, we were really excited to go there and to meet our brethren there in this, uh, in this congregation, uh, not only because of the, the good work, but it also gave us a little time to do some uh, genealogical research. Uh, I do have ancestry in Wales, and we were able to visit on one day, we were able to visit a, a small town, and we parked across the street from a, a Church of Wales building, <clears throat> excuse me, a Church of Wales building that uh, my seven-time great-grandfather was christened in in 1721, so that was kind of cool for us to go. What's happening here is um, Saturday fun day um, on the, the 16th of June of last year. And this was a day in which the building facilities were opened up to the neighborhood. They had some games there for children and some refreshments. And then we started a gospel meeting the next day uh, that went for several days while we were there. 
and uh, made some contacts for the church and really came to love and appreciate the brethren there. This is the building that, uh, that they meet in. It is a building that dates back to about the mid-1800s. It was originally built by, I think, a Baptist group, but our brethren own it now. Um, it was kind of, a, kind of a cool thing to be able to preach in a pulpit uh, that was that old, but um, uh, just, just a great group of people. And then the next month, in July, I got to visit um, Sim Reap, Cambodia. You can see Wes Autry there in the back to the, to the right. And um, I was able to teach the last class before the, this group graduated. We, we studied Revelation for that week. A great group of young people there uh, that I was very happy to be associated with. While we were there, and you've probably no doubt seen this carving uh, before, but we visited Angkor Wat Temple Complex there. And uh, I've got my finger there. Let me zoom in so you can see that. That is a carving that dates back to around 1200 A.D. of a Stegosaurus dinosaur. I'm pretty sure that whoever carved that, um, what would that be, 800 years ago, didn't see a picture of it on National Geographic. But somehow or other knew what they looked like. Now the guides there, I'm told, will tell you that's an armadillo, but I've never seen an armadillo that looked like a Stegosaurus. Graduation was Saturday while I was there, and um, I was very honored to be a part of that graduation. Uh, great, great young people there. And then I wanted to include some pictures of the campus. I don't think I've, uh, the Denver campus, I don't think I've had any pictures like this in previous reports. I do have to defend uh, Brandon there closest to the camera. It looks like he's in chapel playing on his phone. Um, that's how he takes notes. And uh, he's got his Bible on there, and, and uh, uh, you know, every day I would look over there thinking, Brandon, what are you doing? Oh, okay, I got you. I don't know how his generation is able to take notes with just his thumbs on a, something that small, but, but he does. And then some pictures from the um, uh, student break room that we uh, around uh, one time there. And then we go into the classroom. These were our juniors and seniors trying very hard to look like they don't see that I'm taking their picture <clears throat> and failing miserably. Um, but um, we just had a graduation. I'll show you a picture of them here in just a moment. Uh, but a, a great group of, of students. Dave Chamberlain, if you can uh, see him back there at the back, is actually teaching this class. Dave is the last one of my teachers that I had when I went to school out there 40 years ago. Um, he was dean of students then. Was he dean of students when you were there or was somebody else? Well, that just ruined my story. Thanks a lot. <laughs> he was dean of students 40 years ago. He's dean of students today. And so I tell him sometime he's not come very far uh, in the last 40 years. Dave is also one of, one of our elders there at Bear Valley, and we just love and appreciate him. He's a walking encyclopedia. In fact, I think he wrote the encyclopedias. Um, and then we move over to the freshmen and uh, sophomores in their class. And we had a large class that came in last August, um, counting men and women and children. I think we added to our um, attendance figures about 44 individuals with the coming in of that class. So it was a large class. And let me just say also, I mentioned uh, men and women. Uh, and Steve mentioned this a little while ago as well. We have started a new program of women's studies. We're offering now a, an associate's degree of women's studies. And the tagline that we're using is serious Bible study is not just for men. And here's the reason why we, we, we decided to add this program. For, I guess, most of its history, Bear Valley has had one of the top wives programs in the brotherhood when it comes to schools of preaching and I don't mean to minimize the work that the, that program has done for over 50 years now <clears throat> it, it was always more than just how to teach cradle roll and how to make bulletin boards but to kind of exaggerate the point we wanted to go beyond that because we have some of our uh, young ladies and our wives who are going to leave Bear Valley and they're going to be teaching in ladies' days, they're going to be speaking at, at lectureships like PTP and things like that. 
And it became obvious that we needed, for, we needed to prepare these ladies to speak in, of course, gender-appropriate situations and settings, but they need to stand up and preach the same gospel that the, that the men are learning to preach. They need to do it and, and learn to do it as effectively as the men do. And so we felt there was a need for this program, and we've, we've had uh, several young ladies who have come to school to study for this degree, and um, that comes with some inherent issues. Apparently, they're all going to get married here sometime soon because now they're in with the, with the guys, uh, the single guys there. But uh, it, it's a great program. We're very proud of it. John Moore is uh, teaching this particular class. If you're not familiar with John, we're very blessed to have him on staff. Uh, if you're familiar with the Searching for Truth study guide, the DVD that's, that he produced and the, and the booklet, uh, John is the originator of that. The other half of the year, he's with us two quarters out of the year, the first and the third. The other time of the year in the second and the fourth and then into the summer, he's working with his, his organization, Bible Land Passages, and they organized our trip to Israel last year, and we'll be doing that again next year in March, and uh, so we're very thankful to have John and Carla uh, more uh, as part of our team. And this slide, um, I'll just let it... Uh, play. Um, we now have 37 schools beginning in Denver and 37 international schools. We've added several. I think there were seven that were added last year and I'll get to those figures in just a moment. You can see uh, a little bit if you can tell that, that there's a um, map of the world there, how widespread they are. It's hard, it's getting harder to keep this slide up to date because every time I put together a presentation, I've got to ask somebody, how many schools do we have? Because did we add one last week? Are we, are we going to be adding one by the time I give this report? And sometimes the numbers change while I'm out giving reports. I had one trip earlier this year where I reported to five congregations on that trip. And uh, it, it, I finally just gave up. Okay, I'm giving you a, an approximation of the schools that we have around the world today. Uh, that we're, the work is just an amazing work. Let's get to the the um, 2018 year-end report. 766 students. Now, these figures are just. The active students we had in the schools that we had uh, last year and the work that, that's going to come after this is just the work that those students did. We have over 100 graduates uh, last year and um, we don't get these figures from graduates. It's just from the active current students. 766 students, 3,956 baptisms just last year by our students around the world. 85 new congregations, 36 restored congregations, one with 122 members. And I've explained this before, but in case there's someone here that's not heard this explanation, what is a restored congregation? Several years ago, and I believe this started with one of our, our first school in Cameroon in the city of Wotutu. So it's a large city. And on the weekends, the students from this school go out into the surrounding villages to evangelize. And when they would go into a village, oftentimes, where there was no church, they would encounter members of the church. They would say, yes, I'm a member of the, of the Church of Christ. Oh, I, I didn't know there was a church here. Well, there's not. Well, where do you worship? Well, we don't. And the reasons for this were varied. Maybe the preacher died and the church just gradually drifted apart. Or maybe there was a missionary working there and they returned to America and, or wherever and the church gradually died. But for whatever reason, the church had died out there. But there were members of the body of Christ in that village. And so they began, and they use this term, restoring that church. And they would have students that would go out and preach for them and minister to them and, and encourage them and people would come back and now they're worshiping in these congregations. And one of those last year, they found 122 members. Can you imagine that they were able to restore 
back to faith. 32 schools last year, and then in 24 countries, seven new schools. Now, when you put that together, oh, and 178 graduates. When you put that together with the previous four years, so in the last five years, from 2014 through 2018, this is what those statistics look like. 589 graduates have gone into the field preaching the gospel. 13,756 baptisms just by the students. Again, we're not counting what the graduates have done since they graduated. Just while they were students. Almost 14,000 baptisms. 251 new congregations. 68 restored congregations. Now I mentioned graduation two weeks ago. This was our latest graduating class. It was a great day. It was a, it was a great school year again. And I want you to know how much I appreciate the continued support, the, the financial support, but also the support that I get that we get by coming and visiting congregations like this to know that you're involved in this. What I have shown you here as part of the work is part of your work. This is a work this congregation is responsible for. And again, I'm appreciative to you for allowing me to be a part of your work. It's an important work, as you just saw, almost 14,000 baptisms in the last five years. That's exciting. What did we say earlier? That, that we will always giving thanks to God. 13,700 plus souls better prepared now for eternity than they were five years ago because of people like you. So again, thank you so much. We're going to sing our invitation song here in just a moment, giving you the opportunity to make right anything that may be wrong between you and God. Think back to Paul's prayer in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. That's my prayer for you, that you will be filled with the knowledge of God, the true knowledge of God, that you will be able to, to walk worthily as you leave here. That you'll have that kind of, of desire to be what God wants you to be. If we can help you do that in any way, will you come as we stand together and sing?